So for this week's Fiscal Focus, we thought we'd re revisit the property market, which of course has a major influence on the finances of everyday Australians. Joining us to discuss the latest developments is Ray White's Chief Economist, Nerida Connersby. Nerida, welcome to the Savings Tip Jar podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Nerida, for being on here. So uh, we were talking a bit off camera about the term listing authority. Um, what's your what's your sort of on the boots experience with uh, Ray White agents and what are they coming back to you with um, in regards to like vendor confidence? Um, are pre-sale numbers uh, before they're on uh, sites such as REA and Domain, are they dropping off and are agents fighting harder for listings or are they waiting longer to secure them? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we're finding is that there is a definite shortage of old properties for sale and it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. Uh, the big problem is, is that sellers are a little bit nervous about the market. And, you know, we know that most sellers are subsequent buyers and uh, with interest rates having risen so quickly, uh, people are a bit, bit uncertain about the outlook. Um, but one of the problems it is creating is that even though we have had uh, all these interest rate rises, uh, this shortage of properties on market is creating uh, far quicker price growth than anyone expected. And so we are starting to see prices creep up again. Uh, it was a pretty good year for buyers last year. Even though interest rates were high, we did see prices fall back a lot, particularly in our biggest cities. But this shortage of properties available is is creating a, a lot of challenges, not just for agents, obviously. Agents would like more properties to sale, uh, but also for buyers, there's just not much uh, choice for them at the moment. Just expanding a little bit on that narrative about that <clears throat> low confidence of vendors to sell at the moment. Um, obviously, we're starting to see that the RBA is uh, looking like they're going to pause potentially uh, next month. Um, some people saying we've probably reached the peak in interest rates. Um, do you think that will spur more people to, to start selling their properties and, and maybe that will have an influence on, on the property prices we're seeing at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we have had, um, those 11 interest rate rises, um, it has been very stressful for people and we've, we've had this dual situation that has been a really tough time for renters because renters have been, rents have increased very rapidly, but obviously more rich payments have increased a lot too. So, uh, it does look like that we are close to the peak. So um, we did see that surprise interest rate rise in April. It was a, a little bit unexpected. Uh, sorry, in May, um, if we didn't have a raise in April, we had an increase in, in May. Uh, at this point, the market is pricing a hold and the market is also pricing uh, that we are at peak. So things can change rapidly. Uh, I think all the positives, uh, inflation is starting to come down uh, and, and that's great. Obviously, once that starts to get to a, a much lower level, it does mean the Reserve Bank doesn't have to increase rates so quickly. Um, and then the other positive is that it is, uh, it is likely to lead to people coming to market again. So uh, and this greater positivity, or not positive, it's not really positivity, it's just greater certainty. So I think, you know, people are still stressed and people are, you know, interest rates are high, debt levels are high, but at the same time, when people start to, to think that uh, the increases are over, it does start to encourage a little bit more activity back into the market. Okay. For sure. Um, and we'll move slightly to the uh, rental market now. We'll just do a bit of myth busting. So um, is the rental is the record rental price growth directly correlated with rate rises or is there more to it? I think a lot of tenants think, oh, you know, my landlord has had their mortgage rate go up, so therefore my rental price goes up. But there's more to it, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, rent, the rental market is a, a really complicated one. You know, I, I think um, on one hand, there is that, I mean, it's not a misconception. I mean, what we, we know that landlords can increase rent in this environment. And the reason they can increase rent is that there are many rental properties available. So if we had a situation where interest rates were rising as they have, but there was lots of rental properties, then the landlords wouldn't be able to increase rents. So Fundamentally, the problem is a shortage of rental properties. Uh, it is something that has been building for a long time. I think, you know, a lot of the the concern has really been raised over over this year, pretty much. But it has been building for the the past eighteen months. That eighteen months ago, we started to see rents rise at a very rapid rate, and um, and at that time, we started to call out that you know there is going to be a problem emerging here, primarily because international migration was starting up again. And um, we did have a period where there was no international 
migration. We actually lost people to overseas. Uh, but once that international migration started up again, it did create this really strong additional pressure on rental availability. What we find is that when people move interstate or they move from overseas, they tend to rent first before they buy. And um, and that that's definitely the case at the moment. We are seeing a lot of renters, whether they're students renting, whether they're people, you know, that, that are here for employment, um, that they are needing housing. So we've got a real circular problem. Like on one hand, uh, rents are, are rising very rapidly. We need more housing supply. Uh, we've also got a construction crisis. So the construction industry does have a shortage of workers. Uh, we need workers, but we don't have anywhere to house them. So that's that's really problematic. And then there's a bit of a problem too because rental increases feed into inflation. And so but with these round increases in rental payment in rental rates, uh, that's feeding into inflation. And when inflation rises, Reserve Bank also has to increase rates as well. So they increase rates, it means less homes are bought by investors, which means pipeline of new development also gets gets reduced as well. And um and we have it's it has emerged as a as an issue that won't be fixed quickly. And we're looking at, you know, potentially a period of you know, three years in which we're going to have a shortage of rental properties. And um, and at, at this point, we're not seeing a lot of state or federal government focus on, on really trying to fix it. Now, we saw that the uh, new New South Wales government has announced plans uh, to reverse the first on buyer choice program, which of course allowed uh, first on buyers to opt to, instead of paying land, uh, sorry, stamp duty, opt to pay a land tax instead. Uh, what are your thoughts, your general thoughts on, on what effects that will have on, on the property market in New South Wales? Yeah, so, so the Labor government, is, they're switching to a slightly different um, incentive. So um, I, don't, I don't know the exact um, scheme, but I, I think it's no stamp duty up to a, a certain price point. It's, it's what they're, they're planning to change to. So, um, you know, it's good. I mean, we, we know the big challenge with first-time buyers is that emission deposit. So... Anything that um, helps them get into the market quicker is is a is a good thing, and um, we do have around Australia various incentives that that help first home buyers. So the the stamp duty concessions in New South Wales is is one example. Uh, we've also got federal programs available. So the the first home buyer scheme is one where you can um, buy on and with only a five cent deposit. Um, and not pay mortgage insurance. So normally you need to have a 20% deposit to, to not pay mortgage insurance. So there's various schemes available that, that are about, that, that are there for first-time buyers. Um, buying your first home is really fun. You know, I, I, I can't expect it enough. I, I, one of the, the worrying things is that we see is that at retirement that people who are renting are at a vastly, in a vastly different financial um, situation to someone who, who owns their own home. And to the extent where if you're a renter in retirement, you're more, you know, you're much more likely to be in poverty than someone who who sits for a home. Um, even at a, you know, even at a, at a more short term, you, know, you can see some of the challenges with people not owning their homes. That someone that bought, you know, just I'll give an example of Newtown. You know, it's a popular suburb of Sydney. Someone that bought ten years ago in Newtown would probably, possibly, you know, they would be paying them. A little bit high, I mean, possibly a higher mortgage rate than they were paying 10 years ago, maybe less, depending on the timing. Um, but someone who rented in Newtown 10 years ago would be paying a lot more in, in rental levels. So when you are a renter, you're very, very susceptible to, to market dynamics and um, and also susceptible to not being able to remain in the house that you have. There's not much sure, surety of, of tenure, which is problematic. Um, but even in the suburb, and and what we do see is that people who, uh, you know, started renting in a you know new town or somewhere that was quite cheap 10, 15 years ago, as those suburbs gentrify and and become far more desirable, then rents also start to increase because more people want to live there. So it does become quite problematic for for renters. So one of one of the things that I'm always pushing with younger people is. You know, get on the property ladder. It doesn't matter what you buy. And I, I think this is one of the challenge for first home buyers. They're wanting to time the market. They're wanting to buy something, you know, in their ultimate dream property. And, you know, the reality is, is that most people, when they buy their first home, it's, it's pretty shabby. You know, I think of my first home was a 
fake brick clad, weatherboard, you know, with a, a 60s kitchen, you know, it was, it was very run down. But once you get onto the property ladder, you start to pay off that. Um, ideally, you benefit from a bit of capital gain over time, your, you know, your wages increase. Um, and, and so you start to build wealth um, through that way. So it is um, it is important that first-time buyers get into the market and um, that there are really long-term financial benefits for them to do so. For sure. Well, that's kind of a, um, a bit of a hard message for me at the moment because I'm looking at buying my first home. And I think because I work in the industry we work in, you know, it's very easy to get bogged down in all the news and um, try and maybe time the market a little bit and um, pick the perfect, you know, first home. Um, but I think if I just got my foot on the property ladder, that might be the way to go uh, potentially. Um, but we'll talk about um, first home buyers a little bit more. So what, um, aside from getting your foot on the property ladder, what are some of your general tips for first home buyers in this environment? You know, price increases or price decreases rather haven't really uh, compensated for the rise in mortgage rates. Um, so a lot of first home buyers might be finding it tough at the moment. Um, so yeah, what are your general tips there? Yeah, look, it's, it's really hard to get to to get onto the onto the property. I don't, you know, I, I, there's there's no doubt prices have increased in, incredibly rapidly over the last. 10, 20 years. And if you look at that multiple of income to house prices, it's, you know, it's, it's vastly different to, to what people were experiencing a, a generation ago. Um, I think there's a few things that you can do. I mean, firstly, really understanding um, what is available to you. So whether, you know, it's stamp duty concessions, whether it's, um, you know, the federal government scheme, the 5% deposit scheme, um, is, is really important. Understanding how much you can borrow. And I, one of the, the really good things with mortgage brokers is that you can go and speak to them and, and get a really good understanding of how much you can afford to, to pay for a home is, is important. Um, also looking at um, partnering up with someone and it doesn't have to be a romantic partner and be a friend or another relative. And um, and that was one of the really good extensions of the, the federal government scheme, this most recent budget that they did extend it to not just buying the heights first home with a with a, you know a wife or husband or de facto or whatever. It did ex- extend it to people to to just partner up with a with a friend or a, another relative. So um, I guess that's a, another important one. Um, also, just understanding that your first home is it's not your forever home, and you know as I mentioned before, I think most people's first homes are pretty average. It's they're often small. Um, they're not, they're not um, generally something that you, you, you stay in for, for the next, you know, 30, 40 years. Most people uh, with their first times, they, they sell within a 10-year time period and, um, and upgrade to, to a different property. So, you know, whether that's buying an apartment, um, you know, there are affordable apartments in, in all capital cities. I mean, you can buy in Melbourne's, most expensive suburb, you know, places like Hawthorne, you can buy apartments for sort of four or five hundred thousand, which is, you know, absolutely in the realm of, of most first home buyers. Um, and then looking, you know, whether you don't want an apartment, then then looking more closely at, at homes on the urban fringe is another example. Um, buying a house or land package is, is very popular, particularly for first home buyers that have young families. Uh, and then another idea is always reinvesting that if you're in Sydney and you really want to live in Bondi and obviously Bondi is just a terribly extensive suburb and, and out of uh out of reach for most first home buyers, um, reinvesting is is a is a good idea. So you're looking at a a, a city that's much cheaper. Um an example being Adelaide, for example, where you can buy a home to, you know, three or four hundred thousand. Uh looking in regional areas. I was just um read from they just got back from Mount Gambia and uh, and that game, you can buy a home for around three, three or four hundred thousand. So, you know, looking at areas where you buy a home, you don't live in it, but you buy it and you rent it out, and um, you know, and contribute to the rental stock in that area. So, there's definitely ways to get in. But you know, having worked with first home buyers for for a very long time, and and also obviously being one myself, I I understand that paralysis. You don't want to make a bad decision, and you don't want to be obviously don't want to get caught out not being able to pay your mortgage. I mean, that's fundamentally the biggest problem. But I, you know, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone who bought a home 10 years ago that has regretted it. And, um, you know, people regret it. I mean, every home I've bought, I've, I've 
regretted it 12 months after and thought, oh, I just bought at the peak of the market. I should have bought 12 months earlier. I would have done so much better. But within three to five years, you you know, you do start to see a bit of capital growth and, um, you know, you start to see a bit differently about the property. So, yeah, just, just getting on there is just the, the most important thing. Um, just finally, though, um, I keep hearing about this uh, this so called wealth effect, where you know, obviously, we've seen property prices starting to, to rise again in many parts of the country, um, and some people are saying this could uh, you know encourage more homeowners to to spend because they feel a bit more confident now that it's sitting on um, a house that's worth more money, um, and and that this could perhaps lead the RBA to to continue hiking interest rates. Um, just in your opinion, how much of this wealth effect is is, is a factor? If, if you have a look at some previous cycles, um, you know, we did see a surge in retail spending following a, a significant increase in uh, retail spending and, sorry, significant increase in house prices. And um, and obviously, we do see a surge in retail spending that can lead to inflation uh, and, and or can lead to the Reserve Bank inc- increasing rates. Uh, this time around, it, it is look, it's a very different environment. I mean, if you have a look at what's driving house prices at the moment, it's not low interest rates because interest rates are high and debt levels are very high. What's driving it is fundamentally, firstly, a shortage of properties for sale. So, you know, that's the first step, but also uh, a shortage of, of homes more generally. So people that are renting, uh, you know, there's a lot of renters that are trying to buy homes because rents are so high at the moment. But then also you've got a lot of people who normally buy a new home are looking at the existing market as well. So um, the construction crisis is leading to this much greater surge of activity into existing homes. So at this point, I think you know the, the biggest threat is that rental increases are feeding, they feed into inflation and rent increases aren't going to go away anytime soon and, and that has a kind of a circular leads to this circular problem with, with interest rates because then rising interest rates do lead to lower levels of housing supply. So that, that seems to be a big problem at this point. But but absolutely, in the past, it, it has been a, a driver. Those wealth effects have been a driver of, of high retail spending. Sure. And just quickly, we'll um, take a gaze into your crystal ball, Merida. Um, what do you expect property prices to do in the near future? So say the next 12 months, do you reckon they'll rise, fall or remain steady with this current construction crunch at the moment? Yeah, they're going to rise. You know, they, they, it's, not, it's going to be a bit stop-start. You know, on one hand, um, interest rates are very high and housing, you know, household budgets are very stretched because we, get, we also have a high inflation. So, you know, there's other cost pressures that people are, are being faced. Um, but the, uh, on the other side, we, we just got, we've just got a housing supply problem and um, when we have a look at um, housing approvals, they're they're at a, a very low level at the moment. Uh, we've got a construction crisis. Um, developers are, are pulling back; they just can't get projects off the ground. Um, new homes are going to be more expensive because we've seen this increase in construction costs. So when we start to see new homes increasing in price, we also see an increase in, in existing homes as well. So at this point, they look like uh, they will continue to increase. Um, you know, great news for people that own a home. You know, that's it does seem to lead to, to greater confidence when people's home values do increase. But obviously, big challenges for affordability in Australia that we are an incredibly unaffordable country. Where I think we're the, the third least affordable country in the world at the moment after um, uh, sorry, Hong Kong and um, New Zealand. So we are a very expensive city, but. Sorry, the country, but fundamentally, uh, it's about housing supply. That if you build enough homes in places that people want to live in, uh, you can maintain affordability. But um, at the moment, it's which it's not building enough homes. Erida, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Really appreciate your insights, um, and thanks so much for joining us here on the Saving Tip Jar podcast. Thanks for having me.